Welcome to Rice and Ideas Pod, and uh, I'm Nilanjan Ghosh, and it's a privilege for me to have uh, with me uh, and converse with me His Excellency Manish Gabin, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Regional Integration, and International Trade Government of Mauritius. Many thanks for your time, Minister. My pleasure. Uh, my first question to you is, uh, where do you think that India and Mauritius can essentially effectively collaborate? Now, given the fact that, uh, uh, in fact, there has been a, quite a thrust in India on sustainable coastal tourism, mm -hmm. given that Indian Prime Minister recently visited Lakshadweep, do you really feel that there can be more engagement out there? And there's a growing interest, in fact, in coastal tourism in India as well. Yes. I think Mauritius has had a very long history of coastal tourism. In fact, uh, the bulk, if not the totality of our tourists come to Mauritius for our beaches, for our climate, and for our coasts, basically. I think, therefore, we, are, we would happily exchange experience with, uh, with India, experience in hospitality. I think hospitality is a specialized industry. Uh, you need to know your client. You need to know what they want in terms of uh, leisure, in terms of food, in terms of comfort, in terms of uh, environment, and that includes uh, the more sophisticated tourist who is very conscious more and more about protection of the environment, right. carbon footprint. Uh, so all of these are areas of potential collaboration between India and Mauritius. So, uh, of course, when we talk about tourism or the blue economy as mm -hmm. such, we were talking about coastal tourism. So naturally, uh, one concern that uh, comes is uh, in the context of the SDGs as a whole. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, we talk about uh, you know life underwater as one of the critical SDGs. Now, one very interesting thing that we I'd like to know from you is uh, uh, that you have come up with this uh, this uh, very interesting document, the SDG Investor Map with the, with the United Nations. Yes, and and uh, it's very interesting that uh, Mauritius has come up with such a document, creating some kind of a taxonomy for investors and where to invest. But the, also the fact remains that uh, not only Mauritius as such, but the large parts of the global south has been facing this yawning gap between uh, when it comes to SDG finance, between the needs and the supply of finance. So where do you think that uh, can we work together or how are you planning to get into uh, bridging this particular gap? We have also gone through this period of uh, bridging the gap. Uh, the way we did it, uh, and it was quite recent, is mainstreaming SDGs within public policy mm -hmm. of government. And we did that not only with the United Nations, but with all development partners, as we call them. Uh, so therefore, the SDG has become uh, the backbone of public policy. So in any strategic partnership framework that we are uh, signing, let us say, with the United Nations, is carved around the SDG. So this, with this type of mainstreaming, you can have a four or five year strategic partnership framework around the SDG. This therefore um, um, ensures implementation. I think this model of mainstreaming SDGs within public policy can be replicated bilaterally as well. Uh, learning from the experience with the UN system on SDG, we could replicate with any other country. So that means that this is more like creating a business case out of SDGs. Exactly. And it is also uh, easy to explain to a development partner or to uh, a partner country. Well, as you have said, life underwater means something, you know. Right. <laughs> so th from there, you can move easily in terms of cooperation. <laughs> I mean, that's very, very interesting, in fact, that uh, how do you essentially create those instruments and institutions by way of which a business case for the SDGs can be created and uh, mainstreamed, in fact, uh, as far as uh, uh, this is something like making profit a public good mm -hmm. in certain senses. Well, for, that also brings us to, uh, suppose, say, the post-2030 framework, because we have uh, barely now six years left. Mm to meet this, is whether we are going to meet that or not. But the goals are always emerging, right? We might meet, suppose, some of the goals. We might not meet some of them. So in a post-2030 framework, what might be the role of uh, this multilateral uh, frameworks or institutions that exist? 
especially from a development uh, uh, governance paradigm. The, this uh, 2030 will be a watershed movement, I believe. If we take the case of India, uh, it will be the 7 trillion mark for the economy of India. So I think uh, India will play an even more important role in terms of uh, collaboration, not only with Mauritius, but with countries in the region. The, the, the model of development itself is changing. You know, uh, when, when the SDGs were crafted, and now times have changed. Yes. We need to adapt. Uh, we might not achieve uh, all the SDGs. We can tweak a few, but still uh, keep efforts ongoing. Uh, with a few tweaks here and there, uh, and adapting, for example, when you see of uh, energy production, mm. 10 years ago and now, the difference, clean, the, the effort going towards clean energy mm. now and what it was 10 years ago, I think there's a huge difference. Absolutely. So we will need to adapt and tweak on the, a few SDGs, but the efforts should be ongoing and we will be, we'll get there. We'll get there. And, and what about this multilateral institution? Suppose say UNSC. Okay. <laughs> Name it, yes. <laughs> no, we... I think the case has been made since a long time. We need to reform. There are two ways of reforming. Either you wait for chaos, and then out of chaos will emerge a new multilateral right. system, or you reform it through a controlled process now. Hmm. UNSC emerged out of chaos, post-war. Right, absolutely. You don't want to wait for another chaos. Hmm for reform to happen. So I think we should get down together and reform. The UNSC has shown its limits. Mm. This is beyond any doubt. They have shown their limits. It was created for a particular purpose to avoid conflict. It is toothless now. I don't need to make a case for that. Right. If, if reform is not happening now, we are heading towards chaos. We don't want to get there. We need to reform before. Mm. That and we need to have this reform and uh, the engagement about reform in a very uh, concrete manner. Uh, slow progress, but meaningful progress has to be made. UNSC is just one. Mm. There are other uh, institutions yes. uh, where we need to tackle the reform agenda. So, so, so of course, that's a, a pretty much a security concern. But of course, uh, I mean. The way, in fact, we find security and development inextricably linked with each other. Naturally, the development question also comes here. And, and uh, so, so, given the massive blue economy potential mm -hmm. of Mauritius, so is there? Do you have a real blue economy plan, especially in the context of uh, coastal development? Apart from tourism, we talked about we talked about that blue carbon, then suppose a blue food. So, uh, can that be a replicable model for other parts uh, of the global south, which are seeds? Totally. I view my country not as a small country, but as, a, as an ocean state. We have a small landmass, but a huge uh, ocean territory. Almost, if you want to, to compare, our ocean territory compares to the landmass of India. More than 2 million square kilometers. Right. So the potential for development, even when you look at, uh, everybody talks of uh, carbon capture and forests, but carbon capture with seaweed is twice mm. that of forests. These, these are areas for cooperation, not only on the coast, but EEZ and beyond. Coming to uh, blue economy, the architecture has to include security as well, mm. because without security, there'll be no trade. Right. And uh, trade, especially in the Indian Ocean, we are talking of more than 60% of global trade through the sea lanes of the Indian Ocean. Hmm. So it is, uh, it is crucial to maintain peace and security within the Indian Ocean for purposes of trade. Right. Not only on, on sea, but also on land. Hmm. This is linked, therefore, inextricably with the reform agenda on multilateralism and UNSC. Absolutely. Without peace and security, there will be uh, uh, no trade. And the development agenda will be heavily impacted. So all this is linked. Mm. Coming back to the blue economy, we need to have a blue economy strategy adapted to our development model. Absolutely. 
the blue economy strategy in, uh, of one country is not the same as the other. I think here, and, and we, have, uh, we have the advantage of having the institutions already in place. I have in mind institutions like uh, the Indian Ocean Commission mm -hmm. for the five islands in the Western Indian Ocean region. But in the, for the larger picture, uh, the institution such as the IORA, the Indian Ocean Rim Association. I think through these institutions, we can collaborate meaningfully on blue economy strategy. That's wonderful. In fact, uh, the vision that you're uh, laying down essentially is a replicable model for large parts of the global south, especially the small island developing states. So thank you, Minister, for your time. It's been really a pleasure learning from you about the development uh, prospects and the development trajectory that you'd like to traverse. Thank you very much.